Okay, so we're looking at sequencing uh, a very beginner-friendly sequence that you can teach pretty much anybody and breaking completely away from Ashtanga Yoga, breaking away from sun salutations as being part of a practice completely. So we'll start with standing poses that we could very easily do. Uh, how do we start standing? We start in mountain pose, right? So mountain would still be our, our starting point. So everything starts from mountain. And we consider how we do mountain in Ashtanga Yoga, even though it's called Samastitihi, it's mountain pose. It's often done with the feet together. Uh, that's really for people that are quite flexible. So we teach it with the feet about hip distance apart, parallel. And the advantage of that is that it sets people up to do uh, postures where the pelvis is facing the front foot. So if you think of your warrior one, Parshvottanasana, those are really great vinyasas to do. Um, those would all work very well with the feet hip width to help with the balance. Uh, so that's one category of standing vinyasas that we could do is stepping back to a warrior one. So that's one option. Um, warrior one stance. It would group together postures that uh, follow those same sort of alignment conditions in the feet. Parshvottanasana, uh, a warrior three, if you're doing a balancing pose, that's a bit more intermediate. Uh, but generally those sort of principles. And the other ones, uh, there's a second category, which are uh, postures where the pelvis is facing the side of the mat. So we'd be opening up to the side of the mat, but the, uh, the front foot is still facing straight ahead. So you have one foot facing this way, other foot facing straight ahead that way. Those are the warrior two poses. Okay, so some different options for standing vinyasas. And then the other one is, uh, is basically still staying in mountain. It's even simpler, so it provides a, a more ideal starting point. Just mountain, standing there and doing vinyasas with the spine and with the arms. We could also do vinyasas with the legs, like folding forward, but the, the feet wouldn't be changing here. And that's the beauty of these, is the simplicity. We're, we're setting up the feet for the right away, and then the feet don't change. The, the knees can bend and straighten. That's a great way to challenge ourselves and build energy and strength dynamically. Uh, we can hinge at the hips, we can fold forward at the hip, we can fold at the spine, and we can also make movements with the arms, flexion and extension. We have all the other arm positions we can also explore. We also have different spine positions we can explore like rotation, uh, side bending. We can do all those things uh, just within mountain pose. So it gives you a lot, of, a lot of possibilities. And you can even take that knowledge and apply it to a student who needs to sit on a chair to do practice. You can do every movement of the spine sitting in a chair, just like you can do it in mountain. You can do every movement in the shoulder. Yeah, so there's a lot you can do. So we have our standing vinyasas, something like that. And as we were mentioning, the general uh, order of things we would follow, at least five vinyasas, and then hold the pose for at least five breaths. I would even say hold the pose for longer than five breaths, just because uh, people do tend to breathe a little bit quick, especially in the first few years. With slower breathing, we don't need to hold poses as long necessarily to get the same uh, physical benefit. So, five vinyasas, which are simply movements with the breath. and then five static breath. And static is when we're holding the pose, uh, no longer moving. And in that, in that silence, in that stillness, you can really notice the, uh, the internal movement of the breath. Just like when you're doing uh, those exercises that we did to connect with the diaphragm more with will, uh, that relaxation response. When you're still, you can really tune in more to the internal feelings and sensations. Okay, so uh, at standing poses. 
And then the other category that we'll work on next is um, positions where your hands are on the ground, but keeping it more simple than that, table position. So we call this uh, kneeling. Yeah, better to call it kneeling than calling it table. Because as, as we saw earlier, uh, you can also do like a camel pose from kneeling, which opens itself to all the same possibilities as what you could do in mountain pose vinyasas. We can reach up, we can fold forward, we could even do a little lateral movement side to side. We could even do twisting from that position, although it might not make that much sense, you know. <laughs> But uh, generally speaking, that's the, the sort of idea there. So for kneeling, if we look at uh, table pose, a weight-bearing position, that's table is our foundation. So I'm just like mountain foundation, table foundation. And what does foundation mean? It means that uh, whatever's on the ground is the foundation of the, of the pose. And so we set up a good foundation first, and then everything grows out of that foundation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Cool, uh, what types of uh, movements could we do in table pose? We could do really good core strengthening stuff and so uh, core strengthening, that's when the torso doesn't move, but the limbs move. So we have the shoulder going overhead that's working on flexibility in the shoulder. We also have the leg going up, which is hip extension. So that's working on the uh, strength and flexibility of the hips. It may, we may not feel a stretch at all in the hips in there, but it's, it's engaging the muscles that will support increases in flexibility of other poses. So in that table foundation, we can say we can do uh, at least shoulder flexion. So around the shoulders, we have what's called bird dog. That was that movement I just showed there. One arm forward, other leg back. So that's hitting shoulder flexion and hip flexion. Um, other poses that work around that principle, we could also abduct the shoulder where it goes out to the side, and we could abduct, uh, abduct the hip. Oh, it's very hard, isn't it? <laughs> What's cool about that is it works uh, all the muscles in your shoulder, all the deltoid. You have the, the, the middle portion, the front portion, and the back portion. The back one is related to more upright standing, but when you abduct your shoulder, all those different deltoid muscles are working. It's very good. That's why side planks are so good to do. Yeah, so we can do abduction. So in bird dog, we can do uh, flexion extension. We can also do abduction in this other variation. And these are still all in the realm of uh, core stability. Uh, anything else we can do without really moving our torso at all? That's, that's pretty much it for those ones. Cat and cow. So cat and cow, those are, uh, that would involve movement in the spine. So those are, those are really great movements. Those are like uh, flexion extension types of movements we could totally do. And we can combine that with these other movements, um, which would make it more of a core stability thing. Oh yeah, great. And, yeah, shoulder retraction and protraction. And what's great about that is that your core is stable and you're moving the shoulders to develop that, that control and awareness. Yeah, that's a really great thing to do. Retraction, protraction. The, the progression of that one is doing it in the plank. I think that comes with the bear pose. Pardon me? Oh yeah, that's another way of working the core and table is hovering the knees with the toes on the ground. Yeah, and that's a very strong core stability thing. It really works on your, your, one of your hip flexors, your psoas that connects from the thigh to the low back is a big core muscle. So for sure, that's up there.
Yeah, so lifting the knees is a, definitely gets into the realm of more challenging variations for sure. Warm them up and then you give them a challenge like that. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, other stability ones, we can look at those smaller movements that are very difficult. So scapula retraction, protraction, for sure. Um, we can also, from that table foundation, um, cat and cow was already mentioned. So uh, cat and cow type movements, which is spinal flexion, looking at the navel, rounding the back, and then extension. So um, a variation of this that involves spinal flexion, but doesn't really involve extension. It involves trying to more core awareness to stay neutral, but a lot of people will actually extend their spine because it's just so hard to be neutral. <laughs> is uh, this one, it's like a bird dog. You can try it with me. Inhale, right arm forward, left leg back, and then exhale, elbow and knee towards each other, and that's where we try to round the back into flexion. Again, inhale, arm forward, leg back, and then exhale, elbow and knee towards each other, repeating that three times. Let's do a few more rounds. Let's get a nice view for the folks at home. We're thinking about you. Hope you're doing this too. Don't just sit on your computer and think you know it all. <laughs> Got to practice. <laughs> Beautiful. It's great. And then on your fifth one, let's go ahead and reach the arm forward and hold that position for one. We'll go up to three counts. Two. And three back to table. Very good. Let's do the other side. Inhale, other arm and leg. Exhale, elbow and knee towards each other, pushing strongly through the bottom hand. Again, inhale, reach. So it's actually quite challenging, eh? It's hard. So we probably want to teach a better foundation around the hands before giving people this kind of thing. I'm just throwing you in the fire today to keep things moving along. <laughs> we'll talk about foundation of the hands. Good, and then last one, reach forward. But this time we're gonna hold the other one for three breaths just to get a taste. So exhale, elbow and knee towards each other, rounding your back, three breath, push strong through your hand. One, two, two and a half, just kidding, three. <laughs> Inhale, reach forwards and exhale, table. Which one felt more challenging there, I'm curious. Holding it in felt more challenging? It felt more challenging. Oh, Barry had a different response. Huh? The balancing part. I feel my balance feels really off with my back hurting. Like, normally oh, okay. that feels easy. I do yeah. that a lot. Also. Yeah. 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 Today, I think I'm wobblier. So this has felt more balancing. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. It's nice to have a different point of view. Yeah. So, yeah, some people have a different experience depending on where their strengths are, what kind of injuries they're dealing with in that moment, that sort of thing. But generally speaking, the elbow and knee one is gonna be harder. Yeah, yeah, good. So those are some really great ways to create heat without doing a sun salute, and they can challenge everybody. Um, I teach my, my mom online once a week, and we do a lot of this kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's challenging, but she can follow along, you know? She's in, she's in her late 70s at this point. Good. So those are a few different things we can do. Cat dog, or cat cow with a bird dog. We, at some point, a pose loses the name. <laughs> we didn't do the uh, table abduction one, but that's, uh, that's also very hard. I think, I think we should do it really quick. Okay, so let's go back to table. Just making you work today. Um, <laughs> we had a soft morning, eh? Yeah, you knew it was coming. So, <laughs> table pose. <laughs> Good. And so this time we'll bring the uh, right arm out to the side, bending the elbow about 90 degrees, and then bring the left leg out to the side about 90 degrees. And then exhale, elbow and knee towards each other. And again, inhale out to the sides. Exhale, elbow, knee. And repeat, inhale out to the sides, abduction. Exhale, elbow, knee, that's two. Last one. 
One, because that's five vinyasas. Inhale, lift again. We're going to hold three breaths. Engage your core and glutes. Three, lift from the fist. Two, and one back to center, other side. And just think about how you might cue it internally to yourself. Inhale, arm and leg out. Exhale, elbow, knee. about five vinyasas and uh, instead of holding for five we're only holding for three just because it's so hard the vinyasas themselves are very challenging but they're approachable and then holding for about three breath if you got there early wait for your peers three <laughs> that was for you, Akasha. <laughs> Two. <laughs> and one back to table. Beautiful. Good. So some very challenging stuff, eh? And you can see it's really just going for those major joints. You're going for the shoulder, going for the hip. And it's, it's very hard to not hit those things. In the movements where we're standing, it's very easy to miss it. With these exercises where you have... Uh, one limb on the, the limbs on the ground, or like one hand, one knee. Um, it's much easier to get into those, those difficult areas. Yeah. Good. Um, any questions on that? Any comments? Cool. Let's move on. Okay, so cat cow, different bird dog variations. Uh, okay. And then there's also um, involves uh, making circles with the hip. And this is one of the easier ones to work on. It doesn't involve as much core stability. So if we're on the hands and we uh, lift one leg up, we we'll make big circles in that hip. We go out to the sides and up. Great for connecting with the buttock muscles and, and strengthening the muscles that we need to develop that flexibility, but also create stability around the hip. Again, very, very approachable position. So hip circles, it's great. Uh, we mentioned cat cow already, so um, another challenging um, but very approachable position. This is uh, twisting, thread the needle. Great as a warm up. So, thread the needle. And we've seen this one before. So, one arm up, and on the exhale, we thread through. And uh, this is doing a lot of different things at once. It's a, uh, as we reach up, it's actually uh, more of a lateral movement, not too different from a side plank or a variation of side plank. So you're getting a lateral movement and then you're threading through to a twisting movement. And that whole time your arm is, is bearing weight. So it's really great strengthening for the shoulder. You think of the difficulty that people have um, holding a push-up, let alone bending the elbows to, for a low push-up and coming back up. This is a nice way of, of starting to build that type of strength in a very gentle and approachable way. So great for, great for the whole family. Yeah. One thing to look out for in that position is if your legs are parallel, the way they would be in table pose for thread the needle, it can put a little bit of stress on the hip when you're twisting and also it prevents your pelvis from following your spine. So if you turn your hips out, all we have to do is bring the toes to touch. Uh, that's gonna make it a lot easier on that hip as you twist. Just one, one little minor thing. So thread the needle. There's both a uh, twist. Okay, so a twist um, and a lateral component. Yeah, a question about uh, which, which one? Thread the needle. Thread the needle, yeah. Oh, your arm goes numb after a while, eh? Okay. Yeah, so if, if you know that you're going to experience numbness in it because you've done it before and experienced that, and it happens again and again, 
uh, start, start to count your breath and then get in the habit of coming out before the numbness sets in. Yeah, the other thing could be if, if we're completely relaxed in the position, that might encourage a bit more numbness. So if you uh, press the hand into the ground actively, engaging the shoulder abductor muscles, um, you may find that that dissolves some of that numbness. If you're just, if you're kind of collapsing into it, that's one thing, but if you're really active in that bottom shoulder, you might be able to stay there without that issue coming up. I, I can't really say for sure. Yeah, you just collapse in. Okay, so don't collapse in. Yeah, don't collapse in and then don't stay as long. Maybe you don't need the stretch so much, you know? Maybe that's an area where you're already flexible enough and um, flexibility is, is just a very small part of it. We ultimately always want to find a way to become stronger in that position because the strength is, you can never have too much strength. You can have too much flexibility very easily, especially in yoga. But uh, strength is much more important. We don't use flexibility in our everyday life that much, around the shoulder anyway, you know? But we need, we need the strength to carry things around and move our furniture around to teach in ho at home and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So uh, on this topic of lateral movements in table pose, lots of cool stuff, lots of really cool stuff you can do and interesting ways you can get in there. Um, we start in a table pose and I'm going to call this the kickstand move. So I'm going to bring my left toes just behind me and then I'm going to reach my right arm up and I'm also going to straighten my right leg out. So basically, my, my body is between two panes of glass at this point. The only thing that's not on the pane of glass is my left foot and shin, which is behind me as a kickstand to support me. And this is really great. You can use this as a lateral movement. You can use it to explore big circles in your top shoulder. And it could even be used as a back bend. And as long as, the, as, long as we make a note to bring the toes more behind us like this, we can really use it as a back bend. If you want to support the head, you can use your hand. It's quite nice. It was a really great way of developing a back bend uh, as well as a side plank and strengthening this aspect of the shoulder that runs opposite to bench press muscles or push up muscles. We're getting the upper back muscles. Very good pose. Uh, I believe it's called gate pose, like, like the front gate of a property. Not a great name. Not sure why it's called that. I like to call it uh, baby wild thing because it involves the same move. But wild thing's a modern day pose, and gate pose has been around for hundreds of years. Um, does anyone know what wild thing is? I prefer not to demonstrate it, but I will. I'll do it. Okay, so it involves this movement, which is very similar to what I was just doing here. So very similar but it's usually entered from down dog or plank. Go onto the outer edge of your foot, bring the toes behind you, kind of like the kickstand principle, but just the toes, and then turning the heart to the sky. Oh, I thought they called it a flip dog. Oh, flip dog, good. Yeah, pose has many names. People were calling it rock star for a while, and they were yelling. It was so, such a weird time in yoga. It's a... <laughs> yeah, uh, flip, flip the dog, sure. Yeah, a lot of names. Yeah, that's a, that's a harder version. So we, we could call that baby wild thing or gate pose, just, to, just so we all know what we're talking about. It's also like a modified side plank. Cool. All right, so standing and kneeling. Um, And uh, let's talk about the foundation now. So the foundation is whatever's on the ground. When we look at putting the hands on the ground, really common is uh, people just don't know what to do with their hands. So they might have like one hand kind of turned in, one turned out or something. Maybe there's like some collapsing in the hands and there's some wrist pain. So ideally the fingers are facing straight ahead. So you can really spread your fingers wide, which is going to create a broader base of support across the hand. So the, the weight is spread over a larger surface area when we spread the fingers wide as opposed to just having the fingers together like that. So just getting people to do that is a really big thing. 
Um, the other thing we can learn to do is instead of only collapsing into the low palm, which is a common tendency, and you can see how that could hurt the wrist if people lean into their hands a lot and come forward, we want to really learn how to press through the upper palm knuckles. So this is a really nice exercise that I, I teach all levels of, of students, especially the older folks and the newcomers. I'm going to spread my fingers wide. My shoulders are just behind the wrist because this will be less stressful on the wrist than if I was to go over the wrist or past the wrist. So I'm going just behind the wrist. And then very slowly lift the lower palm and the thumb and then bring it back down. Lift lower palm and thumb and bring it back down. So the whole time, this upper portion of the palm is on the ground the whole time. Just the, the thumb and the low palm that lift. And we can do that really slow, about 10 times. And then we can do it at double speed another 20 times. Let's go real slow together, shall we? So we'll start off with the uh, shoulders a little bit behind the wrist. Okay, and we'll activate the muscles under the armpits by pushing the hands towards the knees. Maybe you can feel that engagement. It draws the shoulders away from the ears. Okay, now lift the lower palm and thumb and slowly bring it down. And again, raise the low palm and thumb. Slowly bring it down and repeat. So if you want it to be more challenging, you would bring the heart forward by just a little bit, just a little inch or so. The more forward your heart goes, the more it's going to load up that upper palm. Just keep on going. And you want to feel that the uh, forearms are, are getting worked. That's it. Keep on going. Anybody keeping track? Maybe that's seven. Big spread, spread to like 90% of your max. Everybody's seen uh, Lord of the Rings, I assume. Yeah, you know when Gandalf is casting a spell, it's really spreading wide. Yeah. Maybe not quite so much, keep these guys down. There you go, that's enough. Mm. While I'm doing this, I have pain here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so just, just go back a little bit more. Don't go quite so far forward. And focus on really uh, drawing your shoulders away from your ears. So to get the shoulders away from the ears, you can have your palm planted. And you're going to push the hand towards the knee. So push into my hand. Yeah. So that's engaging these muscles under the armpit. I can, I can feel those guys right there. I can, they're fired up. So keep those as you do the exercise there. Okay, now we're going to do it at double speed 20 times. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 30 times. 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 27, 28, 29, 30, and relax. Sit back onto your heels in a toe squat. Give your wrists a nice shake. Ah, good. Let's notice the residue. Probably feels good to be off your hands, eh? Yeah, so whenever, whenever you teach this, get people to go off their hands for a bit, shake it out. You can press the backs of the hands together as well, like so. And then one of my personal favorites after any challenging arm balance, give your wrist a good squeeze. So you squeeze the wrist and then go up and down the wrist with your hand. It'll be a little bit crackly for most of us, I assume. Okay. And then do the other wrist as well. Big squeeze going up and down. And we'll finish it off pressing the backs of the hands together again, making little circles. Good. And then come back to table pose. Cool. And the other aspect of table, uh, that was mentioned earlier is lifting the knees off the ground. So let's, uh, let's really connect into the strength of the shoulder by pushing the hands towards the knees. So you're engaging the muscles into the armpit. And then round your back like an angry cat, spreading the shoulder blades. That's going to engage the muscle called serratus anterior, spreading the shoulder blades apart. And use your exhale to lift the knees off the ground. 
So you can take the feet about hip width. So we're going to hover the knees off the ground. Good. That's it. If, now you can just hold that position. With your inhale, push your hips back like a down dog, but keep the knees hovering close to the ground. And as you exhale, come forward again, shoulders over wrists, and repeat. So knees hovering just above ground the whole time. We'll do about five in total. The closer the knees are to the ground, uh, the harder it's going to be. And if you feel like, hey, I, this is not for me today, that's okay. You can come out. You can also keep the knees further away from the ground as an option. And then we'll lift the hips to downward facing dog, straighten your legs, and then move the hands just in front of your feet, coming into ragdoll position. We'll bend the knees, hang loose. So we're breaking up the exercises where we're on the hands, giving the wrists a break. Let the spine hang loose and stretch out. And then very slowly take the hands forward again, returning to table position. Take your time. Okay, and then the uh, one other aspect we haven't looked at yet is uh, uh, the table vinyasa. Of course, we've done it together, but uh, just to, for a refresher today. So this is a way of building a, uh, a chaturanga by modifying it. So you can set up your table as you usually would, hands under shoulders, and then move your knees further back another half foot or so. Even further, if you wish. Just play around with it. There's no, there's no precise place to be. And then pushing through your hands, take a breath in. As you exhale, send your heart forward past your hands. Your hips can hover just above the ground, or you can bring them all the way down. Bend your elbows. And then inhale, press back up to table. Exhale, sit towards your feet. Hands stay glued down. Again, inhaling, come forwards. Exhale, bend the arms, lower, slowly lower your hips towards the ground. Inhale, table. Exhale, sending the hips back. Inhale, come forwards. Exhale, bend the arms, two more vinyasas. Inhale, press up. Exhale, sending the hips back. Inhale, forwards. Exhale, come all the way down, and then relax on your stomach. So this is where we can enter some supine poses, uh, laying, or, or prone poses as they're called, rather, laying on your stomach. So we'll start with Sphinx pose, bringing the uh, forearms to the ground, and you can simply relax there, giving your body a chance to get used to just being on the ground. So we'll take the elbows just underneath your shoulders, so the hands will be a little bit past your mat, and you can use the forearms to support yourself, lifting the heart. You can even bring it a little bit more forward there, Neka. Totally. Right. Then bring those elbows in about the same width of your shoulders. Yep. Yeah. Then let your heart lift up on an inhale. Good. Exhale, slowly come down. And again, inhale, pressing through the forearms, lift your heart. Exhale, come down. Again, inhale, come up, and we'll just hang out in that position. So the elbows can be just underneath your shoulders there, so you're a little bit wide, some of us. And think of energetically pulling back with your hands, even though your hands are stuck to the ground. So there's an intention to draw the heart forwards. And just notice what you're doing with the back of your legs. Maybe they're engaging a little bit. Maybe you can relax the back of the legs. Maybe that feels fine to be relaxed. Maybe you felt better engaging the back of the legs, so just become aware of the possibilities there. Try it both ways. Cool. Anyone prefer to engage in that pose versus relax? Or? No? With your lower back, it, it feels better to be engaged? Cool. Anyone finding they're, they're more relaxed in the back of the legs here comfortably or just out of curiosity? I don't know. You don't know. Maybe? Maybe not? Hard to tell? I just know which one I prefer. Okay. Cool. Well, the good news is they're both right. I think it's going to be a little bit. I feel like that helps me just get my back more activated. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. So we can uh, come all the way down now. And we'll set up a cobra vinyasa. So hands by the low ribs. Inhaling, lift the shoulders away from the floor. Energetically pull back. And on your exhale, slowly come down. Again, inhale, cobra pose, lifting the heart. And exhale, slowly lower. And we'll do three more vinyasas. Inhale, come up. Exhale, lower. Again, energetically pulling back on the inhale, lifting the heart. Exhale, lower. And last one. Inhale to come up. And then exhale, press back to table position. And since we are just doing some back bends, we'll go into the counter pose, which would be sitting back towards your feet, like a puppy stretch or child's pose, intending the uh, buttocks towards the feet. Try to relax your lower back. If you prefer to have a support underneath your head, you could use your hands underneath your head, or you could use your forearms on the ground next to your head. Try to relax your low back and breathe into it. And we'll come forward to a table position again. And so from your table pose, lift your right leg up, bending the knee. And we'll make some uh, big circles with that right hip. If you'd like to make it more challenging, look at your other knee. And try to keep the left knee totally still underneath the pelvis. So keep the pelvis still. Keep that thigh bone still. Just challenging the stability a little bit more. If things move around, it's not a problem. It's just a challenge you could choose to explore. With your next exhale, step the right foot outside the right hand. You can raise the palm to make space. Cool. And then take a breath to look forward and bend your knee. And with your exhale, send the hips back, straightening the leg as much as you're comfortable. And again, inhale, bend the front knee, gecko lunge. Exhale, straightening the front leg, sending the hips back, and repeat the vinyasa a few times. And then we'll lean back, straightening the front leg as much as you're comfortable. Take five breaths there. One. If it hurts to bow the head down, feel free to keep the heart lifted. Two, three, four. And then inhale to bend your front knee. And then pushing firmly into that front heel, knee over ankle, you can bring your hands up to your front thigh. Cool. Simple vinyasa, bend the front knee a little more on the inhale, as far as you can. And then exhale, push through the heel, reversing the bend, knee over ankle. And again, inhale, bend the knee. Exhale, reverse it, lifting the pubic bone. And again, inhale, bend the knee. Exhale, reverse it. And once more, inhale, bend the knee. Exhale, knee over ankle, pause there, bracing your core. Left arm up to the sky. You can add a little side bend, leaning over to the right, reaching over to the right. So you might feel a nice stretch from the uh, front of the left hip going all the way up the left side body through the shoulder. Inhale, come up, and then exhale, lowering your hands down. Help yourself back to table pose. Planting the palms, fingers spreading, and then circle through that left hip. Engaging through the glute, exploring the range of motion in that hip.
And with an exhale, left foot forward outside the hand. You can raise the palm to make a bit more space. Gecko lunge, feel free to slide your right knee back a little bit and take a breath to look forwards. Exhale, rock the pelvis back, straightening the front leg as much as you're comfortable. And again, inhale, bend the front knee. Exhale, sending the hips back. And inhale, bend the front knee. A few more vinyasas at your own rhythm. As you straighten the leg, engage the quadriceps to help the hamstrings lengthen more comfortably. And we'll bend that front knee. And last one, exhale, straighten the leg. Pause for five breaths. One, two, three, Inhale to bend the knee, low lunge. And then exhale, pushing firmly through your heel. Bring your hands up to your front thigh. As you inhale, explore bending the knee again, as deep as you can. And then exhale, push off the heel, knee over ankle, reversing the bend. Again, inhale, bending the knee. Exhale, heavy through the heel. Inhale, bending the knee. Exhale, reverse, tuck the chin. And again, once more. Inhale, bend the knee. Exhale, reverse, tucking the chin. We'll hold that position. Press the right hip forward, engaging the buttock. You can energetically draw the left foot back. That's gonna encourage your pelvis to turn towards your right foot. And then option to bring that right arm up, reaching the bicep by the ear, lift the shoulder blade, and then add a little side bend to the left. For a lot of people, it's helpful to do that because it encourages the, the heart to come up initially. But it, you can say more neutral is an option as well. Good, and then slowly come back, and then lowering the hands, left foot comes back. Good, and we'll simply bring the, uh, the legs out in front. Cool. Yeah, so that stuff was all done within the, uh, the kneeling position. Um, we didn't really find a way to get into that modified side plank, but there's a lot of ways you can do it that are quite interesting. Um, sitting on the floor like this can be really nice after you've done standing poses as well as some kneeling poses. We've, we saw how you can really create a lot of heat just from kneeling positions. We didn't even do the standing ones today. Um, but within a, uh, a sitting position, there's a ton of stuff that actually is accessible to beginners. So the stuff that isn't quite accessible is the, uh, the poses that involve something like, say, uh, Obviously, like half lotus is out of the question for most beginners, unless you're teaching a one-on-one -on -one with someone who just shows up and sits in lotus before you start class. And you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, that changes things a little bit. But uh, a lot of those movements that we did um, in kneeling, some of them we could actually work into uh, seated positions as well. So, sitting. And what's our foundation in a sitting pose? Can anyone guess? Million dollar question. Just like it was, it was mountain pose, then we had table. Dandasana. Yeah, Dandasana, yes. Gold star for you today, Perry. So Dandasana staff pose. And the intention, of, whoops, the intention of that pose is written within the name. Uh, Danda means staff. Cool, so. Sitting poses. And why is Dandasana so important? Why is foundation so important? And what is foundation here? So we've looked at how foundation is whatever's on the ground. So what's on the ground in Dandasana, in a good Dandasana? 
the, the, what are called the sitting bones at the, at the very bottom of the pelvis. That feeling of rooting down through your seat, which creates the rebounding uh, force of, of lifting the heart. The heels are on the ground as well. That's, that's part of it as well. So the backs of the heels. And then uh, we don't really need the hands. We saw how the arms could do this kind of thing. But if we could use the hands as tools, just like we can use them in table pose to awaken different muscles, we could use them in uh, Dandasana for different effects. My camera work is very subpar right now. Let's see, I'm just gonna put this over here. <laughs> So you're looking into the, uh, into the shoulder stuff with, with Ali, I heard, a couple weeks ago. Quite a bit in the anatomy. A lot of shoulder stuff was going on. So what's really cool about any pose where the, you're working with the foundation is that if you, if you press those foundational elements in a certain direction, that can awaken certain muscles in the body to create certain more ideal positions in the body. So in the case of Dandasana, if we want to engage the back of the shoulder, which is called the, the posterior deltoid, there's also some other muscles that draw your shoulder blades closer together, like your, your rhomboids and your middle trapezius. We can try this technique of uh, bending your knees a bit, just so tight hamstrings aren't really a factor, and then dragging the hands back like this. Great technique to teach beginners. So you're going to bend those knees and then imagine rolling a boat. Inhale, reach back. Now what if someone's arms aren't long enough to reach the floor? It doesn't really work as well. So you can just reach forward and imagine you're rowing a boat. Inhale, pull back, lifting the heart. Similar effect. Cool. So we get the chest lifted, upper back active. Now if your hands are on the ground or on yoga blocks, for those of you with, with slightly shorter arms, here's a cool, some cool things we can try. Okay, so we can pull, press the hands back to awaken the upper back. And then we push the hands away from each other, which will engage these shoulder abductor muscles, your side plank muscles. So give it a go. Engage the upper back, so that's going to stabilize the shoulder blades against your rib cage, so that the things you do with your hands will, will really influence what happens with your shoulder. Top of the inhale, press the hands away from each other. And maybe you can find a, a bigger lift of the rib cage there. Cool. We can also work with the rotations of the shoulders. And what's great about this pose is it's the same rotations that we find in other poses where the arms are by our sides, like an upward dog and cobra. So check this out. If you scrub the hands away from each other, what does that do to your shoulders? We get a little more external rotation. Pretty cool. So that broadens across the chest. And sometimes our index fingers will come up a lot if we really focus on outward rotation. Uh, so that can put a little more pressure in the outer wrist. So what do we do? We push through the index finger, knuckle, and thumb. And those engage the muscles of inward rotation. So we get uh, what's called a, a banda in the wrist, coactivating the muscles of outward rotation and internal rotation. So you might scrub out to get those external rotators on, then see if you can aim your index fingers straight ahead. As if you were doing like a table pose or any other position that involved weight bearing. Cool. Okay, so that sets a really good foundation. Um, now some of the poses that we can do from that foundation, we can work with the shoulders pretty well and we can work with the hips. Okay, so some examples of working with Strengthening the shoulders. And bring the hands back and bend both knees, feet about hip width. And this is one of the easiest ways to approach this type of position to strengthen the back of the shoulder. And you can inhale to come up, exhale to come down. Inhale, come up, exhale, come down. So you could repeat that five times and then hold five breath. Excellent pose for anybody to do. Get all the parents doing it. Yeah. Another really good one uh, involves the same type of position, but
but with the buttocks on the ground. And this is going to work on the, on the flexibility of the hips while also uh, working on core stability and shoulder stability. Windshield wipers going side to side. And so that's just from Dandasana. We have windshield wipers. We have that hip extension movement that also strengthens the back of the shoulder. Really good stuff. Okay, now if you want to work on some really great hip opening as well as a side plank, you take windshield wipers to one side. One hand stays down, just the hand it's in the same side as the knee. And then pushing through that palm, inhale, hips up, arm up. And then exhale, sitting and circling the arm back. Again, inhale, turning the heart towards the hand, reach up. And on the exhale, we sit and turn the heart the other way. A few more vinyasas there. These are the kind of seated poses that people can really benefit from a lot more than trying to do a, a half lotus or something like that. Okay, and then fifth vinyasa will hold the position, lift the hips, reach back, and breathe. One, engaging the glutes. Two, strong in the left side of the core. Three, four, and five, exhale, sitting and then reach your arm behind you and hang out with that stretch in the right hip. So this is working inward rotation in your right leg as you're turning the heart to the right. So you go five breath or more there, that's great. Cool. And then in a real life situation, we do the other side. We're gonna move on. <laughs> cool. So really great hip stuff, really great shoulder stuff. Um, another way you can work within Dandasana to get into the hips and shoulders. Doesn't involve quite as much movement, but it's, a, it's like a modified pigeon position because a lot of people just won't be able to do this pigeon and even this one will feel really uncomfortable for them. So if you place the uh, left ankle over the knee and then bring the hands back behind you, same arms as Dandasana, just move them back a little bit. And then the standing leg could bend like a squat and we push off one heel to lift the hips and then slowly come down, repeating that vinyasa five times. Two, three, four, five, good. And then we'll hold for five. And then we can come down and enjoy a stretch of the hip for another five. What's kind of nice about a, a position like this is that after you've done the work, we want to rest things, right, as a counter pose. So this can put a bit of strain into the lower back for some people. And it's a lot of, it's quite a bit of time on the wrist, right? Like five vinyasas, that's five breath, plus holding it, that's 10 breath. So if we want to get off the wrist and we want to stretch the low back, we could do a seated forward fold from there, or we could simply bring the foot off to the side and it sequences just so, the choreography is just so nice, eh? Half Lord of the Fish's twist. This is a nice alternative to Marichi Asana D as well you're doing Ashtanga tomorrow morning, which you are. Yeah. And these are, one, these are the really accessible seated poses. You can have a tight hip and still do this and it's gonna feel amazing. What might not work for some people is having the bottom leg bent this way. So what could we do with that bottom leg? Any guesses? Yeah, straighten it out. Then you have a super accessible pose. So let's pretend we did the other side, we'll move on. So another great hip opening posture, cradle rock stretch, could be approached by anybody. Simply grab hold of your right ankle and gently rock that leg side to side. And what do we feel stretching when we do this? What, what could be stretching for some people? Any educated guesses? The hips, okay. The groin, yeah, so the inner thighs, the adductor muscles, the groin, yeah. It all means the same thing. Yeah, if we bring it over to the other side a little more aggressively, we can start to get into the outer hip more as well. So this, this actually, this is a great movement to prepare for half Lord of the Fishes, that twist that we just did. 
It's also a great movement to prepare for Janu Shirshasana with the foot along the inner thigh, which could be taught to people that, have, that are comfortable sitting this way. Okay, so if you are teaching it in a class with varied ability, all you gotta do is, uh, if the knee is up, you put a block under the knee, and that way they can relax the inner leg, and it's totally a safe pose to teach. Yeah. Or you can place your ankle over your other thigh or over your shin. That's also a nice way to adapt the pose. Okay, so what's really nice about Janu Shirshasana, you can really treat it as, uh, just like you would treat Dandasana, or like you would teach mountain pose. So you're nice and tall. Ekam inhale, arms up. The way, exhale, reach for the straight leg or foot. Again, inhale, lift the head. Exhale, fold over your leg. And repeat. Inhale to lift the heart and look up. Exhale, fold over your leg. Again, inhale, lift the heart. We'll do five vinyasas total. Exhale, fold. Let's see, that's four. Last one. Exhale, folding. That's five. Good. And inhale, lift the chest. Look up. Exhale, tuck the chin, but keep the heart up. And we'll pause there for five breaths. So we're going to keep the back as straight as we can while softening the low back and lifting the ribs. Five breaths. That's two. You could be softening the belly, lifting the ribs, hollowing out the abdomen. Three. Notice the energy that you're creating by being upright in this pose. Four. And five. Just take note of how you feel after holding that for a little while. Notice if any muscles are feeling a little bit tired from that. Maybe the lower back is getting a little tired. Maybe the arms. The, you're using the abs, eh? The, oh, the calves. Oh, interesting. Okay, so we can fold forward to relax the low back now. Bow the head down. Five breath. So in a way, you know, this becomes like a counter pose to itself. The holding the straight neutral spine can be quite challenging for the spine, especially if you're not used to it. A lot of people overuse the lower back muscles. Forward fold becomes the counter pose, which can really beautifully stretch the low back. So we have vinyasa, develop awareness, hold the challenge, then you get tired, and you do a counter pose, stretching out those tight areas. Now a really nice vinyasa to do after this, a really nice movement you could actually just hold is uh, one of those variations of side plank. So inhale, come up. Exhale, take the right hand behind you. And then we spiral the straight leg in, lift the hips and reach back. And this is one of those beginner friendly arm balances known as baby wild thing. You can simply hold that position. And then exhale, slowly come down. Okay, let's try it on the other side. Cradle rock the left leg. Exploring that range. And if you are a bit looser, you could take the foot into your elbow crease, linking the hands around the shin. You can also kick the foot up a little bit higher, which will add to the intensity if you don't feel much in the pose. And then we'll bring that uh, foot out to the left side, pick up the phone, and then take your left foot to the inner thigh. Inhaling, reach the arms up. Exhale, hold the right shin or foot. Spinal wave a few times. Inhale, lift the heart, then look up. Exhale, folding, slowly bow. And for a tighter student, they'd simply be bending the knee and holding the shin if there's no straps around, or they could be holding a strap around the foot. So let's say that's five vinyasas already, even though it was only a few. Inhale, lift the heart to a straight spine. And exhale, tuck the chin, chest up, five breaths. One. Lengthening the belly. Two. Lifting the heart. Three. Four. Four. 
and five. Inhaling, look up and exhale, bow over the knee. Letting the spine relax, breathing into your back, breathe into any areas that might feel tight. On the inhale, lift the head. And then exhaling, take that left hand behind you. Right arm back on the inhale. Five deep breaths. Head neutral. One. Two. If you're doing drishti style, you could look thumb instead. Three. Four. And five. Exhale, sitting. Very good. Good, so some, some nice options for sitting. I have uh, one more to share with you. So this one's based um, around bound angle. Bada Konasana, where the feet are together like this. And it, uh, it helps us work on a couple things. One of them is squatting. The other one is putting the reach in Marichi Asana. So you reach forward and squat. Then inhale, come up. Exhale, reach forward and squat on the other leg. Inhale, come up. Exhale, squatting, reaching. Inhale, up. And if someone can't squat, they'll just have their feet together and be reaching. But still has its benefits. Still good. And you can reach forward, palm down, inhale, lift the head, walk the fingertips as far forward as you can, and exhale, bow the head down. Your other hand can be off to your side, supporting you, pressing into the floor. Come up, other side, exhale, squatting, reaching forwards, other hand off to the side for support. Lift your head again on the inhale, get some length, and exhale, bowing the head down, squatting firmly into your heel, five breath. One, two, three, four, and five. Inhale, come up. And exhale, relax, very good. And we'll finish it quick. Just lay down onto your back now so you can root the heels, reach the arms forward. And with an exhale, slowly come down, vertebra by vertebra. Bend your knees with the heels just in front of the buttocks, arms at your sides. Exhaling, lift the hips up. Inhale, lower them down. And again, exhale, lift the hips. Inhale, down slope. 